So I'm grateful to be here among all of you today. And I'll be speaking on the topic of happiness. What is happiness and why is it so elusive? We speak this based on 255 in the Bhagavad Gita. So Krishna is telling the characteristics of one who is enlightened. Prajahatiyata kaman sarvan parthamanogatan atmanye vatmana tushtaha tita pragyasta dochate. So prajahati says give up the kaman, says give up desires. Sarvan parthamanogatan. What kind of desires? Desires that have come by the gati, by the pace, by the by the agitation of the mind. Give up all those desires. This itself seems to be counterintuitive. We normally define happiness as the fulfillment of desires, as the satisfaction of desires. But the first thing Krishna is saying, the abandonment, the renunciation of desires. Prajahati, give them up. And then, Atmanya evatmana tushta. Then, when the mind turns inwards, and become satisfied in the self. Such a person is actually enlightened. So essentially Krishna is saying, give up outer pleasures and find happiness within. So let's look at uh, what this verse means. So I'll talk this in three broad parts. What happiness is not. What happiness is. And then how happiness can be enduring. There are many myths about happiness which control our lives. And these make us often run like program machines to pursue certain things which we think are enjoyable. So that's why we'll first discuss about what something happiness is not. Now, first thing is that what, what makes us happy? It is meaningful engagement, not meaningless enjoyment. Normally, we equate happiness and enjoyment together. When I'm enjoying, I'm happy. But more than enjoyment, what we need is meaning. Let me explain this. Now, suppose there is a small child and one child is tickled by another child. Or if we have a member, if I have a small child in a, comes to a family to visit and you tickle. When the child is tickled, what happens? The child laughs. Now, the child starts laughing. <laughs> now, is that laughter happiness? Well, okay, maybe it is some kind of happiness. But if it were really happiness, then we are sufficiently advanced technologically today, we can easily make a perpetual tickling machine. <laughs> And we can keep tickling ourselves for the rest of eternity, for the rest of our life. Would we be happy? If somebody tickles us too many, say, stop it. You know, at a biological level, we may be laughing. But psychologically, we are not, stop it now. I don't want to laugh anymore. Is it today? So, laughter alone, when it has no meaning, it doesn't bring any happiness. In fact, there's a prominent Academy Award winning um, uh, comedian who committed suicide. I wrote an article about him in one of my books. It was titled After the Laughter. So we laugh in public, but the quality of our life is not just determined by the jokes that we crack. So we don't want simply enjoyment. We want meaningful enjoyment. The same point, if most of us like humor, most of us like uh, some jokes, but if somebody told us from tomorrow you have no financial obligations, no family obligations, no professional obligations, just sit and watch comedy shows for the rest of your life. Well, maybe for a half an hour, an hour, a few hours, but afterward, we want to do something. We, we want to get our teeth into something, do something tangible, we'll be really bored to that. So if Often we equate happiness with enjoyment. But if that enjoyment is without any meaning, just tickling or just there is 
physical tickling and you could say comedy is like some mental tickling but after some time it just becomes boring the same principle applies to entertainment now external tech pleasures are just like tickling of the body and the mind which are sensual pleasures we might take even entertainment entertainment is movies or whatever no it's it's tickling and there is some pleasure in it but it soon becomes boring and krishna talks about this nature of external pleasure in 1838 in the gita he says at vishayendriya sanyogad yattadagre amrutopamam parinaame vishamiva tat sukham raj samskrutam so here he is talking about it vishayendriya sanyogad by the contact of the senses of the sense objects so when we get some pleasure it is initially like nectar but eventually it becomes like poison the same thing which is enjoyable after i don't want it anymore so we may eat food it's enjoyable but if somebody gives us too much food to eat i was enjoying it now i can't enjoy it enough now enough so the very thing which seems enjoyable if it is if it is without any meaning it soon goes away the enjoyment goes away unfortunately what happens the happiness is elusive because we seek the initial nectar the initial nectar goes away and then we look for some other object where there is initial nectar and then that object goes away and we look for initial nectar somewhere else that nectar initially allures us but the nectar soon disappears and that's how we keep chasing we keep chasing we keep chasing one of my friends works in the works in the tv industry they told that it's all about trps so it is one interesting thing that the maximum attention that people have when they are watching tv is not when they are watching a program it is when they are surfing channels <laughs> because once when you are surfing channels you just hoping something will be good something maybe the next channel will be good next channel will be good next channel will be good but when you start watching a program okay some of it might be interesting some of it might be boring some of it might be just okay so the attention goes down so we all know it but we just keep going from one object to another to another to another and it's illusive because we are looking for the initial nectar and that nectar ends so the very thing we think will give us pleasure after some time it stops giving us pleasure uh, there was some study done of uh, nowadays every time a new phone gets launched what is the latest iphone no. 11 okay x is or 10 is already 11 so now when a new phone is launched it's sometimes a stampede in stores to get the phone but but some surveys have found that 90% of the people who buy a new version of the phone don't use any of the new versions new features of the phone <laughs> <laughs> and why get the phone it's just a glamour oh i have a new phone but after some time that glamour just goes away and then when we are attracted to the glamour then okay the next phone when we like when will the next phone come up again the glamour so we keep looking for the initial nectar and there is that nectar no doubt but it is very initial an american player at oscar wilde said that fashion everybody wants to be fashionable so he said fashion is a form of ugliness so unbearable that we have to change it every few months <laughs> somebody who wants to be very fashionable the worst put down for them is somebody calls them old fashioned <laughs> and the same dress the same hairstyle the same whatever it is after 6 months it just becomes hey it is so old fashioned hey, old fashioned no i am not old fashioned we need to buy something new that's how happiness is illusive because what we are looking for is enjoyment which is in itself does not have any meaning and that enjoyment doesn't last for long another way of understanding this is let's look at it from a diagram point of view when we have the sensual pleasures what is happening that the senses and the sense objects they come in contact say <clears throat> our eyes see something enjoyable our tongue tastes something delicious now when the contact happens there is some pleasure over there and that's what we normally uh, what the world touts as enjoyment and yes there is some pleasure however the problem is that 
in this all three are temporary the objects that give us pleasure their capacity to give us pleasure is temporary the same food that is irresistibly delicious today after 2 3 days it starts it gets spoiled it starts stinking and we can't even keep it in our presence so the objects themselves are temporary then their capacity to give pleasure how long can we uh, the contact between them is also temporary so if we eat some delicious food it stays on the tongue for some time and then it just goes in and most importantly our senses themselves have a finite limited capacity to enjoy quite often when we seek pleasure what we do is we think i don't have good enough sense objects to enjoy i don't have attractive enough objects if i only had a more attractive object i would be happy and people keep searching for more attractive objects but even if we had the most attractive objects in the world to enjoy what limits our enjoyment is not the unavailability of, of the objects but the limitedness of our senses itself even if we owned a five star hotel with the best food over there how much can we eat i was at a program in university in in canada so there was a student he had a poster on his like a saying on his t-shirt this 90% of the world's women are beautiful the remaining 10% are in my college <laughs> <laughs> now <laughs> <laughs> no <laughs> what that meant is that in today's world we through the media are presented the most attractive looking objects from everywhere and when we get captivated by that kind of sensory stimulation the the sensory stimulation available in the real world always pales in comparison so in general we always keep hoping that there will be some better enjoyment out there somewhere but the sense enjoyment when we seek pleasure through that it is intrinsically a doomed project not because we don't get good enough objects but because our senses themselves have a finite capacity to enjoy and that's why krishna says that it's not just i early i'm making a separate point now earlier i said the pleasure stops being pleasure when it comes boring but it doesn't just become boring it also becomes distressing because we get hooked to it yahi samsparsha jaa bhoga dukha yona yevate how does it become how does it become distressing because see everything in this is short lived except the craving the craving stays for a long time somebody is an alcoholic they may drink and they may drink and they may drink and now enough and then they may throw up and they may have hangover and everything but at that time they may say oh, when they have a hangover i'm never going to drink again but maybe just that very evening oh, when can i go and have a drink again so what krishna says that this craving is nitya vairina it can become like a eternal enemy this stays on and on and on and on so actually the search for pleasure is often the cause of the greatest trouble the search for pleasure is often the cause of the greatest trouble if you consider addiction nobody is born smoking a cigarette from their mother's womb but what happens they think oh, i'll just enjoy a little bit they enjoy a little bit but afterward they become addicted about drinking it is said that first uh, the drinker takes a drink then the drink takes a drink and then the drink takes the drinker <laughs> so people get hooked to it so so the craving completely binds us so the so, so this seems like pleasure and the whole world glamorizes that this is pleasure but actually it is not pleasure it disappoints and then it torments so now what happiness is not then let's look at what happiness is so i started by saying that happiness comes not from meaningless enjoyment meaningless enjoyment means just some stimulus something that stimulates our senses or our mind but it comes from 
meaningful engagement so if you look at it broadly we live in a uh, in a materialistic society which often defines success and happiness in the in these two terms collecting and consuming just get more and more and more enjoy more and more alcoholism is a widespread problem and it is a serious problem but equally widespread problem which is often not talked about is shopaholism shopaholism is just is a shop 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 till you drop <laughs> so people keep shopping 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 why it just that buying gives some thrill some pleasure oh, i am getting something new i am getting something new so often in today's world collecting and consuming are considered to be sources of pleasure right the more toys you have the the more successful you are the more famous you are sometimes somebody might have a big house but all that big house provides them is the privilege to have a lot of space in which to feel lonely and unhappy so now there's nothing against big houses nothing against wealth nothing against having possessions but the problem is not having possessions the problem is thinking that possessions will bring happiness possessions how they are used that determines our happiness not just having the possessions so the world tells us that collecting and consuming is what gives us pleasure but actually if you look at the most deeply satisfying moments of our life they are centered on something else it's on connecting and contributing when we had some very deep meaningful sweet interaction with someone if you look back at our own lives even if we went to some place where there was a lot of enjoyment but it was you know, maybe we connected with another human being and it was not just the drinking and the party but it was if we connected with another human being even in that that is much more meaningful than the sensual stimulation so we want to connect with each other and contributing means we want our existence to count we want that by my existence by my living by my function by by acting it i can do something worthwhile for someone this is a deep rooted need within all of us and if in fact for this sake for connecting and contributing we are often ready to do the opposite of getting sensual stimulation some people sacrifice so somebody might decide if there, if there is some loud one or not even loud one some people might just donate their blood if there is a big crisis and people need blood now actually you are getting nothing your own body blood is being taken away we will donate it because they feel i am contributing something so it is actually when we connect with other human beings and we contribute to others contribute our existence does some contribution that's what brings satisfaction let's look at it a little bit more uh, we all long to love and be loved in fact uh, when we want to connect with people it is the physical attraction is obviously a part of it but after some time that loses meaning what we want is a more deeper connection and we are long to love and be loved the harvard medical school had a did a survey of american american teenagers and american youth so from the 1960s when the hippie culture started coming in there has been in america what is called as the and increasingly all over the world what is called as the sexual revolution the sexual revolution was the idea that that in the past there are so many rules and regulation rules that restricted our enjoyment and they were not just enjoyment they thought it restricts our, we we want to love we want to express our love why do you restrict it so they said no rules we will just freely enjoy so their idea was we will have free love but the result of that when they met these students young people who go to parties and to they they go all this enjoyment they found that most of them felt profoundly lonely and profoundly guilty although their bodies may come in contact with many other bodies but they knew in their hearts that they were just using each other 
the other person is using me to scratch an itch and i am using the other person to scratch an itch and they felt lonely and they felt guilty so actually too much focus on the physical sensations takes away the deeper emotional connection and that's why we have so much loneliness in today's world so we want to connect and then not just connect we want to contribute in today's world even among the youth there is a increasing inclination toward activism activism means we want to do something tangible we want people who join environmental activism social activism or cultural activism because the world is so complicated and we just can just feel so insignificant and lost in the world i was at a temple nice uh, nice devotee community over there but most of the kids they were not coming to the temples and the parents were anxious so then some of the parents they we 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 had a talk and discussed i mentioned to them about activism and then what happened was they decided that they we were going to make our whole temple green eco friendly and they called the kids and they told them can you take the responsibility for this and the kids formed a committee and now every every week for the sunday feast they would come to the temple not so much to hear the class or even to see the deities but to make sure that all the waste is disposed to the eco friendly way but at least they would come because because at that age you just want to do something just not just sit and be talked to so there is a zeal all of us have we want to contribute in some way and to the extent these two are there to that extent we could even say happiness is multi layered there is some physical sensations which are fine but they are very peripheral there a deeper happiness comes when there is when we connect and we contribute and so this is something which is when the now we can connect whom do we connect with we could say we connect with our family members we connect with our friends we connect with people in our society and what do we contribute to yes we can contribute in various ways that's important so but what will make this happiness enduring so this happiness of connecting and contributing it is actually of a different nature it is often like poison in the beginning yat agre vishamiva parinaame amritopamam tat sukham satvikam proktam atma buddhi prasadajam that it tastes like poison in the beginning but nectar in the end connecting with another human being is is not that easy sometimes you might feel that ah uh, that uh, uh, okay i hope to meet someone and just the first moment i meet them i feel a connection with them so is there something lo- like love at first sight well there may be but love at first sight is fine the real test is what happens after many sights <laughs> so huh? yeah, what if it endures initially there might be attraction but eventually for it to be enduring it, there has to be we have to go through many ups and downs we see the negative sides of each other so to connect with another human being in a deep level at a deep level it requires commitment and it is like poison in the beginning the relationships that we develop especially the deep enduring relationships they are like building a tree it is building a tree means for many for a long time you have to water the tree then the tree will give fruits and shade so it is poison in the beginning even contributing if you want to contribute in any meaningful way first of all we have to have something worth contributing if somebody wants to say contribute by becoming a doctor and then serving the underprivileged people then they have to learn to be a doctor if they want to contribute in any way we have to learn the skills how can we contribute if we don't have anything worthwhile to contribute even if we have special abilities those abilities need to be developed and that development of abilities it requires dedication it requires hard work so this this happiness is a deeper happiness it it requires us to go through some poison initially but once we go through the poison then we come to the nectar 
and then when you come to the nectar it is immensely fulfilling and if we are ready to go to the poison then only we can get to the nectar but what happens now if you contrast these two poison in the beginning nectar in the end and nectar in the beginning poison in the end so if you just look from the appearance perspective this looks like there is no pleasure here this looks there is so much pleasure here and we just and the world what happens is it just provides us unlimited objects all with their nectar in the beginning being shown in front of us and thus we go from one to one to second to second to third fourth like that so those who are not committed to something can get distracted by anything the distracting object doesn't have to be irresistibly attractive as compared to the poison even the thinnest layer of nectar will look attractive and you get distracted by it so what we if we want to pursue happiness we need to recognize i will have to go through this poison and that requires intelligence so if we just get carried away by the world's propaganda of what pleasure is then we will just keep chasing things which seem pleasant and soon they will stop being pleasant and some of them will also become unpleasant and thus we will happiness will elude us and unhappiness will over envelop us it will overwhelm us now going further how happiness can be enduring this requires a spiritual connection a spiritual understanding so if we go back to the starting verse what krishna says is that prajahati yada kaman don't chase give up the desires for external pleasure that means don't get caught in the nectar in the beginning it will end just give it up but then what is he saying atmanya evatmana dushta turn inward so what is there in inside the gita explains that beyond the body beyond the mind we are essentially spiritual beings we are souls and the soul is a part of the whole the part of the all attract the supreme mamaivam shiv jeeva loke jeeva bhutah sanatana is we are all parts of krishna and the contact of the soul with krishna is the source of the ultimate happiness sukhena brahma samsparsham atyantam sukham asnute sukhena brahma samsparsha sparsha the contact <coughs> the contact happens it is atyantam sukham the ultimate happiness at the same i had earlier shown about senses and sense objects now the difference is that the senses and the sense objects are temporary and their contact will also be temporary but krishna is eternal we are eternal and once a connection is held established between us and him that connection is also can also be eternal now this connection is not a physical connection it's not that we can go on the altar and touch krishna and we experience some current of happiness that connection is the connection of the heart it's the connection of the consciousness so when we connect with krishna that is what can bring enduring happiness to us and that brings us to so i earlier i said that connecting and contributing that's what gives is meaningful engagement meaningful satisfaction happiness and if we want not just something which is meaningful but something which is eternally meaningful something is enduringly meaningful then we need to connect with krishna this connection with krishna that is the essence of bhakti yoga bhakti yoga is not just uh, some set of rituals it's not just visiting the temple or going down in front of the sacred images or lighting an incense all these have a purpose all these are practices and they have a purpose that purpose is to connect us with krishna so sometimes people have a negative attitude towards rituals but rituals when they are infused with spirit spirit plus ritual becomes spiritual so when we do these practices with a devotional disposition then they connect our consciousness with krishna and to the extent our con- consciousness becomes connected with krishna we start experiencing inner serenity inner stability inner satisfaction now we may say okay all this is fine i can connect in world but i still have to live in this world i have to function in this world how do i do that? that's why bhakti has both these aspects there is connection internally and there is contribution externally so we connect with krishna through our devotion 
Shri Prabhupada translated bhakti as devotional service. So devotion is the internal connection, service is the outer contribution. And so whatever role, whatever we are doing in the world, we do it in a mood of service. Yatah pravrittir bhutanam yena sarvam idam tatam svakarmanatam abhyarcha siddhim vindati manava in the 18th chapter 46 47 and 48 krishna talks about how we can we can spiritualize our activities in the world so he says that the work that we do if we understand that all of existence comes from krishna itah pravrittir bhutana and not only has it come from krishna but it is pervaded by krishna yena sarvam idam tatam he is present everywhere svakarmanatam abhyarcha so that lord who is everywhere by your work worship him and then siddham vindati manava by this you will gain perfection you will gain satisfaction so all the work that we do our work can be motivated by different things uh, we might work because we just want some remuneration we want some money so that we can continue our life that's one level of motivation and it's 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 necessary that we need some something to for a living but that motivation itself is not particularly inspiring i'll conclude with one example and then we can have a few questions <clears throat> once there were three teachers in a school and these three teachers were asked what are you doing the first teacher said can you see i am trying to hammer some sense into the stupid kids mm -hmm. so the second teacher said okay you know i am earning my living the third teacher said i am helping create the future of the world by shaping the minds of those who will be the future of the world the activity is the same but the vision is different and when the vision is different the motivation level is different the inspiration level is different so if we just look in every activity that we do there are going to be problems and any work no work in the world is easy but if we have that vision okay this is such a it's such a disagreeable kind of work so many problems over there then not only are we fighting against the world we are fighting against our own mind also to get the work done will be half hearted will be lackadaisical will not be happy will just do it but will be karshati will be a struggle if we think i'm just doing it for earning a living then what happens the work itself is not meaningful it is only the result of the work that is meaningful and then the work is something just i have to go through so that i can get the result but if we can have this devotional vision of course the there the vision was not exactly devotional but it is a bigger picture i am the teacher is thinking i am contributing to the future of the world then that brings much greater motivation so bhakti gives us this vision that each one of us we have certain abilities we have certain gifts and each one of us can contribute to the world the contribution itself we have, some of us have lots of talents some of us have small talents and some of us can make from external perspective a big contribution some of us can make a small contribution but it is the biggest contribution can, that we can make is the consciousness we bring to the world the consciousness we bring means that if we are constantly irritable and complaining and annoying then we just make our hearts darker we make the world darker around us krishna is present within our hearts he is the supreme light and when we work, when we become connected with krishna internally then that connection brings the his supreme light that divine light into our heart and from our heart into the world each one of us can make our world a brighter and a better place not just by the work we do but by the consciousness with which we do the work and when we have this presence of krishna we are not so dependent or affected by our situations because our happiness doesn't depend primarily on the situations we are connected with krishna internally so that brings us inner satisfaction and then we work externally 
and when we work in this way we all can make worthwhile contributions from the world's measuring standpoint some of us may be able to make huge contributions some of us may be able to make may not be able to make such huge contributions but each of us can make a positive difference now how much of a positive difference that will be actually if we see we all can think of certain things which we are doing that is making our life the quality of our life somewhat worse and you all can think of certain things if you just think for few minutes you can think maybe two three things if i stop doing this small things my life could be better two three things i start doing this then my life will become better we all may resolve to do these things but it's not easy to act on our resolutions because we are distracted by pleasure or we are distracted by trouble by this all oh, this nectar is there why go through this poison we get distracted but if we are connected with krishna internally then we will be able to have that inner strength and with that inner strength each of us can make a better contribution it may be to our children as in our, as parents it may be in our work environment it may be as neighbors it may be as devotees now how much of a better contribution we can make we all don't know that the discovering that we all can be better human beings and do better things than what we are doing right now how much better discovering that is what can make our life an adventure if we pull our act together connect with krishna and let krishna empower us let krishna's love flow through us now how much good krishna can do through us that is what can make our life ultimate adventure so people think of adventure sports and adventure tours they are all about getting some sensations jump out from a parachute go on to a hill station all that is fine but it's superficial the meaningful adventure in our life is when we connect with krishna and become channels to contribute on his behalf and that the bhagavad gita says is the art of happiness atmanya evatmana tushta the soul connects with krishna and then contributes in the world in a mode of service to krishna that is what will bring us atyantam sukhamashnate the ultimate happiness so i'll summarize i spoke today on this topic of what is happiness and why is it so elusive so i started by talking about broadly we talked 255 in the gita so i said that three parts what happiness is not so happiness is not just meaningless enjoyment it is meaningful engagement meaningless enjoyment means just stimulation if somebody tickles us physically or somebody tickles us mentally by the humor for some time it's fine but afterward it becomes boring why because such pleasures they are like nectar in the beginning but poison in the end so we chase the nectar and nectar ends we immediately start seeking a second nectar third nectar fourth nectar and just goes on and on so uh, fashion is a form of ugliness that soon becomes unbearable and not only does it uh, not it not is disappointing but it is also distressing why because the senses and the sense objects the sense objects are temporary the senses are temporary their connection is temporary but the craving stays on and on and that craving torments us so what is happiness then happiness is not by two things i said it is not by there are four c's does anyone remember those four c's consuming, consuming, consuming or collecting. collecting it is not in these things but it is in collecting. connecting and contributing yes thank you yes now we can collect things but it is what are we collecting them for is it just for consuming or we are using those things to contribute to connect that's so then at a, at a human level also if we look the deepest moments the most fulfilling most joyful moments are when we connected with some other human being in a deeper way and then when we did something which contributed to the welfare of someone else which made us feel that is my existence counts so that brings a much deeper and endure deeper level of happiness and then lastly i talked about how this happiness through connecting and contributing can be made enduring that is we connect not just with each other but we connect with krishna so we are souls and the soul soul is eternal krishna is eternal and the connection between the two is established and connection can also be eternal and that connection is established through devotion so we practice bhakti yoga 
by coming to the temple and doing various rituals they become spiritual when we do it in the right spirit and they establish our inner connection and with that inner connection we go out in the world and according to our particular positions and dispositions we make contributions and the biggest contribution that we can make in the world is the consciousness that we bring if we are satisfied and cheerful then the light of krishna can shine through us and make our world a better and brighter place and we all can become better human beings and do better things if we connect with krishna all those intentions that we have all those resolutions will be able to implement them and how much good we can do discovering that can become our life's most exciting adventure thank you very much hare krishna so are there any questions or comments yes please Sir, you mentioned in the beginning, and you started with the with the verse from Gita that they should not like we should give up desires. Yeah. And then later part you mentioned that you know, we have to live in this world, so we have to be like doing our work. And so that that's basically my question: the contradiction between the two. Okay. Yeah. So. So initially, I said that. So initially i mentioned that we have to give up desires but then i said we have to work in the world and we have to contribute see you see what krishna specifically says over there prajahati yada kaman sarvan partha manogatan this is those desires which come by the agitation of the mind so the mind is always chasing for whatever looks attractive whatever looks pleasurable that is this looks such nice nectar that's nice nectar that's nice nectar so if we keep chasing that which looks like nectar we will never get much pleasure actually if we keep doing whatever we like we will end up disliking ourselves if somebody just you know if they just keep stay on their phone or the computer just any site that comes up click it any youtube video watch this now after a few hours they say why wasted so much time and they keep doing it day after day after day Oh, those people who spend hours and days and weeks on video games and net surfing if you actually look at them like they have extremely low self esteem oh, they they just unhappy people they try to forget that so they don't even like themselves so when krishna is saying prajahati give up those desires he saying that the desire to look for some quick nectar that is the desire you give up but then we work meaningfully and at the end of the bhagavad gita also krishna tells arjuna do you do your work nimitta matram bhava savisachi become an instrument do your service make a contribution that means we should be willing to go through the poison to get to the nectar okay thank you yes hari krishna so since one of the one of the impediments to happiness is comparing comparing our contribution with somebody else's contribution right <laughs> think that our contribution is very small and their contribution is very big so therefore it minimizes our own sense of uh, satisfaction in what we're doing so how do we overcome that yes uh one of when we make a contribution also sometimes we compare our contribution with others contribution and uh, we feel my contribution is so small and that causes dissatisfaction so what to do about that Yes. The thing is that even when we make a contribution, it is the absorption that is really critical. If somebody is making a contribution, but after that they want glorification for their contribution, then if they get their glorification, they will be happy. If they don't get their glorification, they will not be very happy. So we want to make a contribution, but actually. essentially the contribution is also a way we become more absorbed in krishna and the contribution is not what krishna needs primarily from us krishna wants our consciousness through that contribution there is that well known verse which i just quoted in the bhagavad gita 1132 and 33 where krishna says tasmat tamutishta yasho labhasva jitva shatrun bhumsha rajyan samriddham मयै वैते निहता पूर्वमेव निमित्त मात्रं भवसौ व्यसाचि 
So he's telling Arjuna, fight this war. Arise, fight, attain victory. The enemies are destroyed by my plan already. You just fight and win a flourishing kingdom. Become an instrument in the fight for me. Now this verse is actually saying something significantly deeper than what was said earlier. So in 247 Krishna says, don't be attached to the fruits of the work. And then he says that Yat Karoshya Dashnasi Tat Krushu Madarpanam Offer the fruits to me. So he says that don't be attached to the fruits. Offer the fruits to me. But this verse is telling that the fruits are already with Krishna. The war, the enemies are already defeated. So actually Krishna doesn't want the fruits from us. Krishna wants us through the fruits. It is in trying to offer the fruits to Krishna that we offer ourselves to Krishna. So if we get that priority right, ultimately whatever service we do, yes we want the external results to offer to Krishna, but the essential thing that Krishna wants, if Krishna wants he can just get the results in one moment. We want to build a big temple, we might go and make endeavors to, to make, make various arrangements. But in the Krishna can, in the heart of the, as a Paramatma, can just inspire one person and that person may just do everything also. If Krishna wants, he can do that. But he engages us so that we have some service. So that's why if we focus on that point, that the, the contribution is so that we can become absorbed in Krishna. Then we won't feel so dissatisfied if our contribution is less. And another thing with respect to contribution is that Bigger contribution also means bigger distraction. Bigger distraction means in the world, if somebody is making a bigger contribution, they might be doing it selflessly. But the more visible we become in the world, it is just the nature of the world. That if you, if we build a mountain or if we build a mound, you have to dig a hole somewhere. So if somebody is making a big contribution, they are becoming famous. In this world, fame comes with infamy <coughs> and that, uh, in, in one sense, both fame and infamy are big distractions. You know, fame can distract, oh, I am so great. And then infamy comes, what happens, anybody who becomes successful, somebody or the other will find some reason to criticize them. Even if they are of impeccable character, still people will find some reason. It's, it's just the nature of the world, people can't tolerate. Uh, the envy comes out. And then it's it's very painful. So it's just bigger contribution doesn't come come free. It has its own costs. Of course, if Krishna wants us to do a bigger contribution, we are happy to do it. But but the bigger contribution can also has a bigger distraction. And that's why we can say uh, we can say that at one level, Krishna knows what is the contribution that we can make best. And Krishna gives us that much empowerment. If, if we become purer, he may give us more empowerment. But becoming purer means what? Means focusing on him rather than the world. So that's why it's not so much the qual quantity of our contribution, but it is the quality of our consciousness that matters. In the Ramayana, there is the story of the monkeys were all carrying giant boulders to help build the bridge for Ram. And there's a squirrel who was carrying just small, small dust particles, small pebbles. And um, one of the monkeys said, hey, get out of the way, you are coming in our way. Ram told uh, no, that she is doing her work according to her capacity, fullest capacity. And you are doing according to your fullest capacity. I appreciate her as much as I appreciate you. So in the Lord's eyes, the quantity of our contribution is not as important as the quality of our consciousness. Okay. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Yes, Madhuri. Hare Krishna. Um, in respect to connection and contribution, um, when one is in that position of 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 that one? In respect to um, commitment of our, to connection and contribution, 
what my observation has been over time is when devotees often get to the position of connection and contribution, there are various obstacles that come up to test this. And sometimes those obstacles are so um, mind-blowing and staggering and derailing that you actually get off the, the train, if you want to call it. So my question is how to identify this, how to um, relate to it, I guess, and how to, and what, what to do. So the various question. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So when we come to the level of making connection or making contribution, then various obstacles come and they can overwhelm us. So what do we do at that time? We can look at Srila Prabhupada's example. I don't think any human being could have faced as many obstacles as Srila Prabhupada faced. Almost everything that he did, it just didn't work. He tried making, starting a business, he tried running a magazine, he tried running an organization, he tried working with his god brothers. None, none of them worked. So what was Prabhupada's mood through it all? It was Gangi Vogam Udanvati. Just as the Ganga keeps flowing toward the ocean. So now sometimes the Ganga might just be a small trickle which is flowing. Sometimes it's a huge river. In some parts, it just has to hit against the obstacle again and again and again. Maybe just sneak a little bit through or sneak left, sneak right. So, when, so like that, just the Ganga, but the Ganga keeps moving toward the ocean. So, there is, there is a path and there is a purpose. So, the Ganga is not attached that I have to go by this path. No. The purpose is to get to the ocean. If not by this path, then by some other path. Not by that path, some other path. So what happens for us is, even when we want to make a connection or we want to make a contribution, we think this is the way I want to do it. And some things just don't work. Srila Prabhupada was immensely determined, but Srila Prabhupada was also immensely resourceful. He was not just forceful, this is what I am going to do. No, if this doesn't work, let's try that. Prabhupada's going to America itself was an example of not just his determination, but his flexibility, the adaptability, the resourcefulness. And even in America, he tried various things. He, he was in the upstate initially, where he's talking with more the kind of people where other yoga gurus were going. But then he went to among the hippies and that's where he got the most reciprocation. So there has to be that, that flexibility, that willingness to adapt. Okay, this connection is not happening in this way, maybe it will happen in that way. The contribution is not happening in this way, it may happen in that way. This doesn't mean that we become fickle and it's the first obstacle we just give up. But we, we need to be reasonable. Sometimes we might be inspired to do a particular thing, but maybe the time is not right, the place is not right, the circumstances are not right. And during that time we might have to, we might have to shift. So we could decide a reasonable amount of time, a reasonable amount of energy we put in. Suppose we are preaching at a we are doing a program at a particular place. Now we might do it that for there for a few months, be few three months, six months, one year. But if we don't get much reciprocation there, we might decide okay that let me try somewhere else. So we need that flexibility. In principle, a devotee is determined. So Bhakti Sutan Sri Thakur said that if you are doing if you are speaking about Krishna, if no one comes, speak to the walls. The walls will hear. It is glorification of Krishna. Now that was in principle, but Prabhupada was not satisfied speaking to the walls in India. Prabhupada came to America. So when when Bhaktivedanta says speak to the walls, what it means is don't lose heart if your service doesn't seem to produce the results, the connection or the contribution not happening. But that doesn't mean we have to just keep doing the same thing. We have to be resourceful. So that's one one point that like the Ganga, we have to be resourceful about moving forward. And the second thing is that when obstacles come, sometimes we may have to streamline. There may be one activity with which we can very strongly connect with Krishna. We may be doing many things to connect with Krishna and we may be doing many things to contribute also. But sometimes we have to streamline. Okay, by this one activity, I can connect very well. We might be doing various activities, but if we say we feel very connected while doing deity worship, or we feel connected while doing kirtan, we feel connected while doing 
uh, doing studying the Bhagavatam then that is what we need to focus on the most and then that that will be that connection will become the source of our nutrition in general I conclude this point that this that let's see in even in our spiritual life and in our day-to-day -day life there are some activities doing them gives us strength and there are some do activities doing these takes our strength just like Murli Prabhu quoted earlier that some people bring happiness wherever they go and <laughs> some people bring happiness whenever they go so what that now people who bring happiness that we love to be with them giving being with them brings warmth brings energy brings strength but some people as soon as they come so as we start feeling as if I can't breathe properly now and then when they go away <sighs> now in all our lives both kinds of people are there mm -hmm. some people it is it just it give, being with them gives strength some people being with them takes away our strength but we, we may not be able to entirely avoid those people if we are obligated and we have some commitment relationships but then we have to make sure the balance that the things that give us strength are not superseded by the things that take away our strength so we need to make sure that we get adequate strength so we need to streamline our connection and maybe in our contribution so that we have adequate strength and then we when we have the adequate strength then we can make whatever contribution we are making it may be less it may be more so be resourceful and then be be we need to be resourceful to find way how to contribute and we also need to be vigilant to make sure that we are we are we are nourished ourselves then we can go through the obstacles okay thank you uh, yes sir. in this verse itself in 255 it talks about happiness to the self hmm. but you are talking about happiness to krishna so i was not able to can you relate these two things oh, okay yeah so here atmanyevat manatushta is happiness through the self but I mentioned I brought Krishna over there so actually the Bhagavad Gita has its own internal flow and it goes toward a particular conclusion at the same time each verse is at a particular point in its flow so broadly speaking how the Bhagavad Gita's flow is that initially the Gita shifts Arjuna's vision from the body to the soul and the first six chapters are primarily about how the body and the soul interact how to stay at the spiritual level while functioning in the body so the vision is shifted in the first six chapters from the body to the world there are three elements in existence Jeev, Jagat and Jagdish so Jeev is the soul, Jagat is the universe, the world and Jagdish is the supreme lord so first Krishna shifts the vision from the body to the soul then that's the first six chapters from the seventh chapter onward Krishna shifts the vision from the soul to the whole to himself to Jagdish and that is where Krishna brings in Bhakti and that's where Krishna focuses on talking about himself and his glories and how how he is the supremely attractive object and eminently worthy of our devotion and then after that after talking about the soul after talking about uh, about god then the last 13 chapters come to the jagat and how do we with the spiritual knowledge look at the world and function in the world so the gita has its own thought flow going on now what we did was we took one verse but we didn't focus only on that verse we used that verse as a launching pad for giving the overall message of the gita and that is what Srila Prabhupada also does he might take one purport in the second chapter but he might explain it not just in that particular context but he might explain it in the context of the whole message of the Gita so in the second chapter also Krishna talks about himself say in 261 he says Tani yukta asita mat para. just seven or five six verses after this he's saying that focus your consciousness on me so here Krishna is primarily at this stage in the second chapter Krishna is primarily the teacher of sense control teacher of mind control but he is giving an hint that he is not just the teacher of mind control he is also the object of the controlled mind 
control the mind and what do you focus on but that he will make it clearer later so here in the first few chapters 267 is there 330 is there then 435 is there between 45 to 415 is there a little bit but there are glimpses but in the middle chapters it becomes much more so what i have explained is in terms of the entire con entire philosophy of the gita that is we have used that as a reference point to explain this verse thank you yes sir. Um, in this day and age now, um, where technology is, you know, the main thing, um, back in the old days we used to colour with our kids and, and do different, a lot of different activities, but now a lot of the activities are just giving the phone or giving a, a technological instrument to the kids. And if you see what's on some of the, they're not all Krishna cartoons, there's a lot of things that are so... Um, addictive, addictive to their minds, and then they have to go out and make sense of the natural world, which is getting quite lost. You know, we seem to live in this green world, and um, we have a world outside that now is actually, in, according to you know, global warming, the world is in a lot of trouble. So, what is our, you know, what is our responsibility to our kids? in this way because this technology is very addictive yeah so earlier you know, we could read read books to our kids and we could connect with them but now technology consumes them and it can often be quite addictive and they do get disconnected from the world with its real issues yes at one level uh, spirituality transcends the culture at another level spirituality permeates the culture transcends means yes we just put aside the culture is the existing culture and we just do our activities say for example what we are doing now is something similar to what has been done in the bhakti tradition in the spiritual traditions for a long time we come and discuss about Krishna, about the supreme lord we glorify him so <clears throat> bhakti has activities which just transcend the culture. However, bhakti is so inclusive that it can even permeate the culture. I have a seminar on internet in the three modes. <laughs> Sometimes you might just think that internet is all distraction, but it's not that simple. On the internet, there is also a culture of sharing and giving and people share knowledge, people share expertise. If your computer is not working, you just go on one of the computer, another uh, forum, the Apple forum or Windows forum, and ask questions. People answer. Wikipedia is an example of where knowledge is being freely distributed. So, technology in some ways has become the language of people today. And within the technology, just as in normal society there are people in goodness, passion, and ignorance, similarly among the world is netizens. People who, who live in the internet. And among the netizens also there are people in goodness, passion and ignorance. So, uh, in that sense the digital world is more or less a reflection of the physical world. It is human beings who have made that world. The big difference however in that digital world and the physical world is that we can go from goodness to ignorance by just clicking one button say if somebody is say in a library or a temple and then they want to go to a bar or they want to go to a gambling den or something like that they have to physically go from one place to another and that requires time effort and maybe there is some public censure involved over there when, but so it's it involves some effort, requires some effort but with respect to the internet you can just go from goodness to ignorance in one moment so now what do we do especially you see more many of us or let's say if we, call, we have we have multiple generations over here some of us who some who have lived without the internet they feel why do you need it just practice bhakti but some people who have uh, who've just grown up with the internet grown up with social media they can't imagine life without it and i was at an interfaith conference in washington and there one of the christian pastors was telling that in the age group of 15 to 40, 40 percent, 40 percent of uh, the 
the evangelical success 40% of people who came to christianity they came through online outreach 40% nearly half of it so uh, there also on the online also people are seeking spiritually so we can't demonize the internet at the same time we can't just be simply utilitarian there are there are dangers in it so essentially it's again on the internet what is someone doing if we are connecting meaningfully we are contributing meaningfully then, then that's also our way of connect that's also uh, worthwhile we may not have physically be looking at people so if somebody just spending time surfing a hundred sites and just stimulating themselves or somebody is going to one site and learning something maybe they are forming meaningful connections over there they are learning and they are contributing that's not necessarily a bad thing and that's 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 the way people will work so that's why i said bhakti can permeate the existing culture also however another so one is one can quickly shift from from the ignorant goodness to ignorance the second problem is that the digital connection can become it is good if there is no physical connection available but when the digital connection is deliberately used to avoid the physical connection then that level of depth of contact which we want and need we won't get that i once saw a cartoon it said that the man was saying that today uh, today evening or last uh, he says last yesterday evening he is telling his friend yesterday evening my wifi went down so i spent some time with my family they seem like nice people <laughs> <laughs> so there has to be some time where we connect with people at a physical level also and sometimes it may have to start with the adults you now maybe if you have a family meal time the adults need to begin by putting their phone away the adults keep their phone and say to their kids don't keep your phone with you well actions speak louder than words and especially if the kids also feel that a parents are hearing me not just judging me see as soon as they feel judged we start closing the doors if, if people feel they are heard they are understood or at least they desire to be understood then they will open so many times people seek the digital connect digital world because they feel i just can't connect in the physical world so we can't just demonize technology we have to provide facilities for for actually connecting in the physical world connecting in the contributing in the physical world and if we do that then there can be a balanced way of operating there is no it's not easy but uh, eventually it is people may get distracted but eventually people get bored with the distraction also initially when you get first time somebody gets a phone or somebody finds a new app or a new game people are people are infatuated but after some time they just get bored so if meaningful connection and contribution is done digitally and physically both then it needn't have it needn't be so distracting okay. so let's stop so thank you very much shri prabhupada ki gaur bhakta vrind ki दाय गौर प्रेमानंदे